Welcome to another episode of Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. I'm Rick and this is Steve. Hi. Hey, Steve. How you doing? I'm doing great. I've loved this season of Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. I have too. And um, I think out of the three we've done so far, this is probably my favorite. Mine too. <laughs> Even though I was really excited when we first started. Yes. It's like the, the, the information for this one just it's intriguing to me. I find it interesting. Yeah. And so varied each week. Yeah. We're really dealing with different things. So what are we going to deal with this week? Well, believe it or not, we're going to talk about snakes, serpents. Okay. And uh, great. what the ancient world believed about them and how they intersect with the Bible. We're not going to have to do any like handling of them, are we? You know, I was hoping to surprise you with that. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you would. As you get up and run <laughs> screaming through the studio. <laughs> oh, you've heard the stories. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. Everybody who's read the Bible knows about Genesis, how Adam and Eve were placed in a beautiful garden. Mm -hmm. And this serpent came, and uh, we know it's the devil in disguise, yes. or just the devil. Yeah. And he told Adam and Eve, specifically Eve, to disobey God. Mm -hmm. That the fruit that God said she shouldn't eat, she should. Mm -hmm. God said if she ate from it, she would die. The serpent said, you will definitely not die. It's funny, God said, you will certainly die. He said, you will certainly not die. Mm -hmm. And it'll just make you wise. And that's why God doesn't want you to eat it. Because he doesn't want you to be like him. And he also told a little bit of truth in there. Because it would help her to know good and evil. Well, why would she want to know evil? <laughs> exactly, why? It was a bad thing that he was presenting as a mm -hmm. good thing. Here, have this chocolate-covered arsenic. Tastes very good. <laughs> Chocolate? <laughs> Tastes good? Okay. And I guess not knowing what arsenic would be or knowing what evil would be, you wouldn't know what the consequences right. would be. Right. All she did know was God said, don't do it. Mm -hmm. And the devil said, do do it. She weighed her options and chose to go with the devil. She mm -hmm. was deceived. So knowing that, I want to talk to you a little bit about some ancient myths about snakes and then wrap it up into a nice little picture by the time we're done. Great. All right. So one of the things we need to know about serpents, um, in the ancient Near East, they were considered as the enemy of both humans and the gods. In the Egyptian Osiris myth, for example, there was a demon serpent who attempts to overthrow the sun god Ra. His job is to try to plunge the world into everlasting darkness, but apparently that didn't work. So <laughs> Trying to fight Ra, that would make him an enemy of one of the gods. And trying to throw the world into darkness, that would make him an enemy of humans. Snake's bad. <laughs> <laughs> the, Sum the Sumerian Epic of Gilgamesh, yes. that's the one everybody knows about because of the flood yeah, story. Yeah. But in there, there's uh, a serpent who comes to Gilgamesh and robs him of this, this fruit. That if he had eaten the fruit, it would have given him eternal life. Now, how close oh, to Genesis is that? Absolutely. The serpent steals. Yeah. I mean, it's just, just all the key elements. There you the go. Story. Thanks. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. a good way yeah. of putting it. Yeah. And um, so we've got Egyptian. We've got the Epic of Gilgamesh. We've got Ugaritic fable with Baal and Anat. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. His lover, Anat, he and she have to defeat this seven-headed, twisted serpent called Lotan. Lotan, in their language, is similar to the word that we now know from the Bible as Leviathan. Mm. And what I find interesting about this is that it says it's a seven-headed, twisting serpent. Now listen to what Psalm 74 verse 14 says. It was you who crushed the heads of Leviathan hmm. oh. and gave him as food to the creatures of the desert. So we learn from the Bible that there's this creature, a creepy creature, called Leviathan with multiple heads. And in this fable, this Ugaritic fable with Baal and Anat, there's a seven-headed serpent. In the book of Revelation, we see the beast coming out of the water with multiple mm -hmm. heads. And we see in Genesis that the son of man, the son of woman, seed of the woman, is to crush the head of the serpent. So all this imagery mm -hmm. comes together in good versus evil, God destroying the serpent, 
And then these fables take some of those pieces and twist them in to their stories. I'm hooked. <laughs> I love it. Keep taking let's me do down more. This path. Yeah, let's do more. This okay, so what I want to do is talk about several deadly serpents that are mentioned in the Bible. Okay. The first one, he's the deadliest serpent of all. He's the one I already mentioned. He's the one that comes in the book of Genesis and deceives Eve. The scriptures plainly say that he deceived Eve, but not Adam. Adam willfully went along with Eve. So Eve did wrong, Adam did worse. And Adam was kind of like, well, he was, he was the head. He was the chief. So when he went after Satan, we as his descendants were brought in that path. Adam and Eve fell. The guilt primarily lays upon Adam, though Eve shares in it. And that sinful nature that he inherited is, I'm going to say genetically, but it may not be so, is genetically passed down to all of his descendants. So Adam conceived of sin and Eve conceived of sin. Mm. And now all of the descendants of Adam and Eve are sinful. Mm. And that's where it all went south because of that serpent. And so when I say the serpents are the enemies of the gods and men, he's the deadliest serpent of all, the devil, the adversary. It's as if we all got bitten in that garden. Mm. And he said to Eve, you're not going to die. Well, where is she? She's dead. Yeah. If he had said, not only will you die, Adam's going to die, and all your children are going to die, and I'm going to plunge the universe into misery and sorrow for the next five millennia. She might have thought, no. I think I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't look that tasty. Well, I don't think I want any of that fruit. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> so anyway, to get us back on track. Okay. The scripture says, by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death have pa has passed upon all men okay. for that all have sinned. Yeah. That snake bit all of us. It's snake venom that has coursed through our veins mm -hmm. through all of human history. Yes. That was the deadliest snake of them all. When I think of the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and the serpent, I'm like, a serpent? Why a serpent? Does the devil look like a serpent? Or did he take on the form of a serpent? Or did he possess a serpent? I don't know. But I often wonder, what did he look like? Did he just look like a regular old snake like you and I know a snake? But he couldn't have because the scripture said... In Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed. You shall go upon your belly mm -hmm. and shall eat the dust all the days of your life. Mm -hmm. So apparently, previously, it didn't mm -hmm. go on its belly. Mm -hmm. So then what did it go on? Mm -hmm. That leads most people to think it walked. Okay, that's reasonable. But why do we assume it walked? Isn't there another means of motivation possible? Locomotion? Yes, there is another means possible. Maybe he didn't walk. Let me read to you about it, an Egyptian snake god. I'm going to pronounce it Nahibakau, but I'm not exer exactly sure how to pronounce it. I'm going to read to you from an article on an Egyptian snake god. It's believed he was a benevolent snake god who the Egyptians believed was one of the original primeval gods. Mm. He was linked to the sun god, swimming around in the primeval waters before creation. That is very cool. And this ties back to something we taught in a previous episode about ancient mythology being tied to the Genesis story by everything starting in the water. Right. So this snake swam. It was a swimming snake, but it gets even better. Listen, he was depicted in the form of a snake with arms and legs, occasionally with wings. Mm. So maybe the serpent in the garden had wings. Maybe it didn't walk at all or was like a bird. Its primary means of locomotion was flying. Why not? We don't know. Nahibukau was invoked by the people to protect them and cure them from venomous snake bites. And at one point in their Egyptian mythological history, he was a very fierce and aggressive deity. So we have a snake god that's fierce and aggressive with wings. There is an ancient tradition of a winged, aggressive, a satanic-like snake god 
which makes me think that maybe the devil in the garden had wings. Just a thought, but there's more. But before I get to it... <laughs> wait, there's wait, more. There's more. <laughs> You're not going to try to sell Ginsu knives on the show, are you? <laughs> and if you call now, with the snake, we'll throw in an extra set of legs. <laughs> But wait, there's more. <laughs> All right. So this is the first deadly serpent I wanted to introduce was the deadly serpent in the garden and a little history about how other things tie to him. The second deadly serpent or serpents I want to mention comes from Numbers chapter 21. And here's what it says. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Hmm. Obviously, there's a whole sermon just in those couple of verses. Oh, yeah. But what I want to focus in on are those two words in the English, fiery serpents. Kind of misleading. But a quick look at the Hebrew and some accompanying verses, I hope, will, I hope will help bring this home. There's two words here, nachash, which is one of the main words for serpent, and seraf, which is fiery. So how is it misleading? Well, it's only misleading in the sense of the vision we take. Mm -hmm. Obviously, these snakes weren't on fire, mm -hmm. and yet they're called fiery serpents. So people assume Fiery is like a euphemism for venomous, poisonous, mm, deadly. That their bite is like fire inside of you, the venom. Exactly. Like, oh, I feel like I'm burning. Right. Yes. Okay. So they say fiery serpents really means venomous serpents, okay. and some translations will translate it as venomous serpents. Mm -hmm. But it's literally fiery serpents. And I think there's a reason for that. There's a play on words going on here, a word picture for the student of the Bible right. to draw our attention to something else. The word seraph. Is only, it only occurs a couple times in the Bible. Seraph, it's not well used, it's not well known, so it's easy to study. One of those instances is in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 29, and this is what it says. For a viper comes forth from the root of a snake, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Isn't that odd? Yes. It just doesn't make it's, any sense. No. It's, just, it's peculiar. It is. Very strange. But we have the word viper, we have the word snake, mm -hmm. we have the word fruit or offspring, and we have fiery flying serpent. The word fiery there is different, but the word serpent is the same, or versa visa, yes. depending on how you look at it. The word seraph is also there. So fiery serpent in numbers, fiery serpent here, and wait, there's still more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, don't give it away yet. Okay, so we're going to come back in just a moment. We're going to talk more about fiery serpents, so don't go away. GLC invites you to visit us on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash GLC TV. Here you can stay in touch with all of the latest GLC news along with daily scriptural inspirations, current specials in our bookstore, links to our newest shows, and online media plus articles from trusted sources. Feel free to drop us a message or a question by posting to our page. Please help us out and like our page by clicking on the thumbs up button. Don't delay. Drop by the GLC Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash GLC TV. We want to interact with you today. Welcome back to Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. We're talking about fiery serpents. Yeah, and the, the point I was making before break, or at least trying to make so ineloquently, <laughs> <laughs> is that this word seraph, which only occurs a few times in the Bible, is associated with flying serpents okay. in the verbiage. Yeah. Even though the serpents may not be flying literally, the word picture is, that's, yes, they do. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah, there's something going on. Yeah, so we have to look a little further okay. to figure it out. Um, so that was Isaiah 14. Okay. Um, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 6, another place the word seraph is used. Into the land of trouble and anguish, from where the young and old lion, the viper, and the fiery flying serpent. Hmm. So we have the fiery serpent, which uses the word seraph. We have the flying serpent possibly in the garden. And then we have seraph and seraph in Isaiah 14 and 30. And both times it's tied to fiery and flying. So the word picture we're getting is that there is this flying, obviously winged, 
deadly serpent. But the word play doesn't make sense in any of these contexts. Now, here's where it gets most interesting. I told you seraph is only used a few, very few times in the Bible. We've got fiery flying, nasty serpent. Fiery flying, nasty serpent. Now look where it's used in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Seraph, same word. Each one had six wings, a winged seraph. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. Okay, this is getting very cool. Yes, isn't this interesting? <laughs> yes, it really is. <laughs> so the word seraph is only used a very few times in the Bible. It's used with deadly serpents, and it's used with the servants of God. The image is of a flying creature. How is it that a divine servant of God can be equated with a winged serpent? With the Genesis story, it makes perfect sense. Satan, as you well know, is a fallen angel. I wonder if he was a seraph. It's possible. Listen to what the scripture says. Now, I'm going to read to you from Ezekiel chapter 28. This passage of scripture, almost every commentary I've read equates this with Satan, which is extremely interesting because there's nothing in the context that says it's Satan. But nevertheless, all these great commentators associate it with Satan. Here's what it says. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering. You were the anointed cher cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. And by the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. So here, if the commentators are right, we've got Satan in Eden called the cherub of God. And the word fire is used more than mm -hmm. once, possibly mm -hmm. a fiery flying mm -hmm. serpent. Yeah. Now, some will say, Steve, the word cherub is used there, not the word seraph. Yes, and I'm not even saying this refers to Satan. It's mm -hmm. the king of Tyre. Mm -hmm. But what's the difference between a cherub and a seraph? I don't know. They're, when you lay them up side by side mm -hmm. in the scripture, mm -hmm. they're extremely similar. Yeah. So the using of the different words doesn't trouble me. For all I know, a cherub is a type of seraph. Right. Could be just synonymous terms. It, it could be. You don't know. Or, very similar. Or pointing out a certain characteristic the other doesn't point out about the very same being. It, it, could, it could be. Yeah. The parallels, mm -hmm. though, are just stunning. Mm -hmm. All right. So we've got this serpent in the garden that's deadly, possibly winged, we know that the seraphim are God's servants in heaven. And that word seraph means the burning ones or the bright ones. So the plan words are when they're up in heaven, they're shining with God's glory. When Satan comes down to earth, he bites us with his nasty venom and kills us. The serpents in the wilderness bit us with their nasty venom and killed us. Plan words, you've got the good ones and you've got the bad ones. Satan is a fallen servant of God. I think that's the play on words that we're getting from seraph, from the fiery flying serpent. Mm. Well, it continues. Mm. Because as I pointed out at the beginning of my lesson, the serpent was considered an aggressive bad deity, but he was also considered 
a good deity mm -hmm. and even associated with healing mm -hmm. and help. So on one hand, he'll kill you. On the other hand, he'll save you. Where did those dual, <laughs> you know, two totally opposite things, where they come from? Well, we found out where the deadliness comes from. In the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. serpent killed us all. In the wilderness, the serpents killed us all. Numbers 21, let me continue with that. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food, no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. The thing that killed us became the symbol of our healing. Now, you know as well as I do that people often say the Bible is full of myth. It's just a bunch of legends. These things never happened. Interesting that something that never happened impacted world culture, not just Jewish culture. I've got some pictures here that I want you to look at. This is a symbol of the staff of Asclepius. Asclepius is the healing snake god of ancient Greeks in Rome. The staff of Asclepius is a serpent wrapped on a stake or a stick, and it represents healing. Now, how did the Romans and the Greeks end up with a snake on a stick that represents healing mm -hmm. if it wasn't for what happened to the children of Israel Absolutely. in the wilderness? Yep. This single serpent staff appears as far back, though, as 2000 BC on a Sumerian vase, <laughs> which is extremely interesting. And for them, it represented the healing god, Ningashida. The symbol changed or morphed and became two symbols, two serpents on a staff, and sometimes with wings and that's known as the caduceus. It's the symbol of modern medicine today. I see them on ambulances sure. driving by me right. in our city. Right. So how is it that our symbol of healing is a snake on a stick with wings? Hmm. If not for everything I've been reading from the Holy Bible just a couple moments ago. The symbol of two intertwined snakes appeared early in Babylonia too. And it's related to the other serpent symbols of fertility, wisdom, and healing. Mm -hmm. So the serpent as being evil is depicted throughout the ancient world, mm -hmm. and the serpent as being a healer yes. is depicted throughout the ancient world. Mm -hmm. Now, didn't you tell me that there was a uh, serpent in a cave somewhere in Egypt? Yes, exactly. In the Valley of the Kings, when you go, it's probably three or four stories up on the side of a cliff, you go into these caves and you travel down this long road, this path in this cave until you finally get to the sarcophagus. But what leads you there is artistry on the wall that is carved into the wall of the image of a serpent. It's the serpent that leads you to the next world. Well, it's funny. From my frame of reference, it's the serpent leading you to death. Well, that's right. And from their frame of reference, yes. it's the serpent that leads to life. Yes. Yea, has God really said? <laughs> That's right. You shall not surely die. Right. right. But Yeshua took all of this mm -hmm. and wrapped it into an amazing package. Mm -hmm. In John chapter 3, the famous John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, has an amazing context to it. Let me tell you what Yeshua said. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Mm -hmm. For God so loved the world mm -hmm. that he gave his only begotten son, mm -hmm. that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes. So Yeshua takes the symbolism of the serpent, that's right. that which killed us in the garden, yes. and that which saved us yes. and killed us yes. in the wilderness, 
And he says, I'm the ultimate healer. I can save you from that deadly, venomous, fiery serpent. The one whose poison courses through the veins of all humanity throughout all time. I can fix it. That's right. He's the ultimate healer. That's right. He's the caduceus. He's the Asclepius. None of those other things. They've got it all wrong. And I think part of this is that imagery of the two snakes on the pole that you see for healing. And the reason for that, I believe, is is because to create anti-venom, you have to use a bit of the venom. Mm. He became sin for us. He became the anti-venom because he had sin in himself? No, absolutely not. But he took upon himself our sin. He became the cure for sin. Nice. Anti-venom. I like that. Yeshua, the anti-venom. <laughs> A bumper sticker. <laughs> it's it, would, true. it would make yes. people inquire, though, yes. wouldn't it? Yes. So we have yet another example how the Bible intersects with ancient culture. We learn about it from the ancient manuscripts. Um, we didn't have time to go into it, but it's not just the ancient East. Uh, even the Aztecs have legends mm-hmm. about uh, what I'll call demon snake gods. Mm-hmm. They have the good, they have the bad. Cultures all around the planet. Yes. This wouldn't happen if there wasn't a kernel of truth. Right. Most of them have lost the true story, mm-hmm. but they retain a bit of the kernel. And I think the lesson from that Egyptian tomb is the lesson for us today. Are we going to believe Satan's lie or are we going to believe in Jesus? Yes. Is the pathway of the serpent the pathway of life? Or is the pathway of the serpent the pathway of death? Yes. As for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, it's, it's pretty clear that these images of a serpent go all the way back to the book of Genesis, the very, very beginning of the story of humanity. So the Bible, once again, is proven true. We hope you're enjoying Rock, Shovels, and Manuscripts. We'll see you again next week. This episode was produced by and for God's Learning Channel. If you're enjoying this series, your financial support will help us keep this program on the air. Simply send your contribution to God's Learning Channel, P.O. Box 61000, Midland, Texas 79711-1000. Or log on to our website at www.glc.us.com and donate using PayPal. Please be sure to designate which program your contribution is intended to support. Thank you for helping us make unique quality programming a reality. Order your copy of this program from the GLC Bookstore by calling the numbers or visiting the website on your screen. Please include the program number when ordering.